Dili was smoking. There were still small fires everywhere. There were militia still operating in the area. It was a war zone. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is in my family. We weren't out there to take country. We were out on your That was their job. I did feel a lot of regret. Friends were still getting killed. It got to the point where, you know, you're going to funerals quite often. Do I lead under fire? And that was a heavy responsibility, I guess, on my shoulders that I didn't want to screw up. War itself is horrific. It's a horror story. It should never be dressed up as if it's something glorious. Not what you can do for yourself, but what can you do for your country? The volunteer for service was, in effect, to put your life on the line. I'm Sharon maskell Dare, and you're listening to Life on the Line. In today's podcast, we meet Major Lily Mulholland, who served in the Australian Defence Force for 24 years as a public affairs officer. Her military career has taken her to East Timor, Bougainville, Mount Everest, and closer to home, she worked at the Olympic Games in Australia in 2000 on Operation Gold. Welcome, Lily, to Life on the Line. Thanks, Sharon. So tell us a bit about where you grew up. So I grew up in Melbourne in the southeastern suburbs in the 70s and 80s. And it was an idyllic Australian uh, childhood filled with long summers at the local pools and cold winters um, on the tram, wishing that we didn't have to go to school every day. So it was very, very pedestrian, very suburban. So tell us then about how you perceived the military when you were growing up. Did you have any military history in your family? Yes, I had one uncle who was in the Army Reserve and I remember going to his investiture as the commanding officer of Monash University Regiment back in the day and I remember he got this amazing sword and he was out on parade And it was all very impressive. And I had no idea that my uncle was a senior person in the military. It spoke to me in in some way and I I really liked what I saw there and it made me think I I might want to go into the reserve. So I I did apply to go into the reserve when I was 21, I think, Um, but I wanted to drive trucks. And I went out to the Oakley Depot and they said, no, you're going to university, you must be an officer. Um, So I didn't want to be an officer. I wanted to drive trucks. So I said, okay, no, thank you. Um, And then fast forward to about 1997, maybe early 98, and I was watching television one day and there had been a tsunami in Venemo in Papua New Guinea. And I was watching incredible vision coming out of the jungle in Papua New Guinea. And there were army tents set up there, Australian army doctors, amputating limbs, um, putting people back together after they'd been tossed around by the waves Um, and there'd been lots of people killed and it was just a really traumatic time for that community. But I was watching this footage. I was working in public affairs at the time as a civilian and I was thinking to myself, how on earth are they getting this footage out of the jungle? There must be a PR team in there. Does the army have public relations officers? And it was the very, very early days of the internet. So I looked up on whatever search engine was back then, it wasn't Google, and discovered that the army was recruiting public affairs officers. So I put my application in and it took 12 months and the process hasn't really changed since then. Um, And eventually I was commissioned. And so I joined on the 18th of January, 1999. So take us back to that time. What did you have to do to get in? So you had to go through an assessment day as a first hurdle and you were seen by a psychologist to see if you were fit to serve and resilient enough to serve. And then you had to do a maths test, which I failed abysmally, but they said that doesn't matter, you're going into public relations. Um, And we had to do all kinds of other aptitude tests and have an interview. And so I sailed through the assessment day, which was great. Um, And then it was an interminable wait. I don't remember how long um, until I sat my officer selection board. And that comprised of a senior officer, a psychologist and a public relations officer. I had to present myself and convince them that I had officer-like qualities as well as the skills to be a successful public relations officer in the Army. And at that stage, I think I had three and a half years of experience 
and I was just finishing off my graduate diploma in public relations at RMIT University. And they came back to me and said, oh, we'll commission you as a lieutenant because you haven't quite met our benchmark of four years and a completed degree. And I said, well, the process has been going for six months already. It's going to take at least another six months before I start, isn't it? And they said, yes. And I said, by then I will have achieved both of your benchmarks to be appointed as a captain. So I think you should appoint me as a captain. They said, oh, well, you don't get to tell the system what to do. And I said, no, no, I definitely don't, but I'm not prepared to join as a lieutenant. And so sure enough, they came back with a letter of offer to appoint me as a captain, which I duly accepted. So what were those first few weeks like? You were in uniform, appointed as a captain. Was it what you expected? Well, I wasn't actually in uniform because I hadn't actually been issued with anything by that point. So I was told to arrive at Victoria Barracks on St Kilda Road in Melbourne at such and such a time on such and such a date. And I was met by the flight sergeant admin officer of the Defence Public Relations Regional Office and taken up to meet my boss, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Seaman, um, who ironically ended up in the army. And they were all lovely to me on the first day and they showed me my office because back in those days you got offices and they were all very nice and I kind of sat at my desk and switched on my computer and thought, now what? And before too long, I got tasks. So I had to take the photographer with me and go and cover tasks at Puckapunyal. So we'd drive up to Seymour to Puckapunyal and we'd watch the infantry blow things up and we'd watch the engineers build stuff only to blow them up and blowing things up was a big theme back then. And we would take photos and I'd write stories for the local newspapers and they'd publish them and it was all very exciting. But I was starting to get a bit antsy about not having a uniform and not really having any military knowledge. And you are appointed as a captain, as a specialist service officer in the public relations service. So there are expectations that you will have certain knowledge, um, that you'll know how to wear a uniform, you'll know how to march, you'll know how to salute. And I knew none of those things. Fortunately, my sergeant photographer was dating a warrant officer and they took pity on me and invited me out to his place one Sunday afternoon, taught me how to iron my uniform, which had been issued by then, how to march up and down his backyard and how to salute. And so I thought, well, if not now, then when? So I ironed my pollies and wore my skirt and my court shoes and my shirt and my lanyard um, and my beret to work on the Monday and just as I was walking in a full colonel was walking out and he said well don't you look lovely today and that gave me all the confidence I needed to march around Victoria Barracks in my uniform. (laughs) So that was January 99 and May was when I went up to Canberra to the Royal Military College Duntroon to do my specialist services officer course, the first appointment course and that's where they really put us through how to make your bed how to iron your uniform, how to polish your boots, how to change really quickly um, and how to march around, how to command troops, um, how to pack your backpack, all of that kind of stuff. So it wasn't really until five months after I joined that I actually felt like I could walk past someone and salute quite comfortably. So how long was the course at that time? Because you were full-time as a specialist service officer What was the length of that training at the Royal Military College Duntroon? Two weeks in the classroom and then two weeks what they call out in the field. But we weren't really in the field. We were on Mount Majura, Mount Majura Range, and we were in ATCO huts. So we were sleeping on stretchers and we were doing a lot of um, field-based lessons. We were learning to fire weapons. I had never held a weapon in my hands before that day. Um, And so it was learning what is a rifle. All of those basic things of how to be a soldier, basic tactics, we had to form platoons and we had to fight imaginary enemies and we had to navigate in the dark and all those kind of things, learn how to put a radio together, how to learn basic RATEL, which is the radio language we use. Um, So we learned all of that at RMC. And I remember vividly it was one of Canberra's coldest winters on record. It was May. And we were doing push-ups in the grass in minus eight degrees. And that's when I realised I was not a civilian anymore. So how did you handle it? I loved it. (laughs) 
And it was really funny because I don't know who the poor PR officer was who'd been through the course before me, but they hadn't gone so well. And so I was getting a lot of stick from the directing staff and they're like, oh, here's another PRO. And because I, I don't know, reverse psychology works on me or whatever, but I was determined to be the best student on the course. And so I was determined to nail throwing the wagtail aerial up into the tree on the first go, which I did. We would have uniform inspection and they'd come and try and find a fault with your uniform. They could never find one with mine. And by the end of the course, they said, ma'am, that was very well done. And I just have lived on that praise for the rest of my career, I think. Did you make lots of friends on that course? And, and if so, are you still in touch with them today? Yeah, actually, I'm still in touch with a couple of them. I'm the only one still serving. It was a long time ago now, but we did. It was like going through baptism of fire together. We were specialist service officers and the directing staff wanted to give us an authentic infantry experience. So, of course, they picked the worst possible terrain on the side of Mount Madura, and it's pretty rocky as it is, but they found um, steep terrain that was basically rocks and prickle bushes and made us leopard crawl up that. So it was full on. I used muscles in my body I didn't know existed. And because it was such rocky, terrible terrain and because I was so determined to be the perfect student, I leopard crawled my way up that mountain. And um, when we came off it, we the women. We peeled off our our camouflage pants and tried to count our bruises, but they were too many to count. It was unbelievable. I've never seen such black and blue legs before in my life, but it was worth every minute of it because we gained an absolute insight into how the combat corps work. And as a public affairs officer, if you don't know what you're talking about, it becomes pretty apparent pretty quickly. So I felt that Even though we were put through our paces for fun, um, we actually got serious insights to how the army worked. Um, But of course, it wasn't until much later when I deployed that I actually found out how the whole organisation, the Australian Defence Force, the Australian government and international partners worked. But at the time, doing that SSO course really did set me up well for the rest of my career. You mentioned deployment because you were fresh out of Duntroon and then you were deployed to East Timor within a matter of weeks, months? I wasn't supposed to go to East Timor because East Timor wasn't supposed to happen. What was supposed to happen was Exercise Crocodile 1999, which is the precursor of Talisman Sabre. And I was deployed up to Townsville as a very shiny new Captain Public Affairs Officer and I was going to be driving a couple of days north of there um, up to Weeper where the RAF had a bear base, RAF base Sherga, and they were going to use it as a staging point for this exercise. Um, So I dutifully packed up my um, trunk and my backpack and headed north and got to Townsville and their regular public affairs officer was currently in Bougainville at the time um, and they needed um, some public affairs. So I filled in for her and did a couple of days of public affairs up at um, Laverack Barracks and, and had a really lovely time in the tropics and thought it was great. Meanwhile, trouble was bubbling over the over the sea and um, East Timor was, was having a revolution um, against the Indonesians and it turned bloody and it was decided the international community would intervene and that Australia would lead a peacemaking mission in East Timor called um, Interfet and that there were going to be 22 partner countries um, brought together in this coalition under Chapter 7 of the UN Arrangements, which meant it was a warlike operation. So the next thing we know, the first media support unit is being stood up. Um, It hadn't previously been stood up except on exercise, And it was the precursor of today's Joint Public Affairs Unit. Um, Only we were not actually posted to the unit. We were shadow posted. So the unit was a skeleton structure only. It had a CSM, a company sergeant major, who would look after the equipment that the unit might need. Um, And in those days it included an outside broadcast caravan, which for some reason was called the Caravan of Love. There was no room for love on that caravan because it was full of outside broadcasting equipment and it had a satellite on the roof um, and it was very um, modern technology in 1999, which now would not look out of place in a dinosaur museum. But it was very well set up and had been exercised and, and 
the imagery specialists knew how to use it, which was the most important thing. So we all suddenly get these phone calls and emails saying, oh, change of plan, Crocodile 99's off, Interfet is on, get yourself to Darwin as quickly as you can. Meanwhile, poor Captain Byrne was in Bougainville and two RER were deploying into East Timor and she would have been the PRO to go with them, but she was stuck on Bougainville, so who got to go? Me. And I'd been in the Army for a total of eight months by that stage. So when you found out you were deploying on a warlike operation after just eight months in the Army, what was your reaction? I was actually really excited. I don't know why I was so excited at the time. It was just we'd seen some of the pictures coming out of East Timor, Timor Leicester's call now, of um, East Timorese people who just wanted to have control of their own destiny and East Timor, Timor Leste, has got a very um, difficult history. The Portuguese were there when they left, the Indonesians came. And so they've never really been masters of their own destiny and they had decided it was time to take control. And for me, that was just such a, a powerful thing for people with not much wherewithal to decide to do against a really big power like Indonesia and to take them on. And that that took a lot of courage and the fact that we could help and that we had the agreement of the Indonesian government and the agreement of the United Nations and we had a coalition of 22 countries just made me feel like the reason I joined the military in the first place, which was to do something bigger than myself but to also serve the Australian community and through them the international community, I was going to get to do that in my first year. Um, So it was really exciting. I wasn't at all daunted because by this stage I'd worked out that pretty much everyone in the Army knew what they were doing. They had a job to do, they'd been well trained and they were going to do it. And even though I was brand new, I knew that I'd be working with really experienced colleagues and I actually hadn't met many of them yet. So I was actually really pleased to go there and meet other public affairs officers or public relations officers, as we were called back then, um, because I hadn't met many of them and I was just interested to see whether they were like me. So you're in Darwin and then before you know it, you're in East Timor. What was going through your mind? Just to take you back a little, I didn't actually hit the ground on the same day as the rest of the media support unit. So the CO at the time had never met me and I bounced in to the barracks in Darwin and I was bright and shiny and very green behind the ears as well as wearing a green uniform and super keen. And I think he took one look at me and went, oh, my God, what am I going to do with her? I was the only female public relations officer. We only had male imagery specialists and the only other women um, were um, people that had been shanghaied from various other parts of defence and put into this unit to provide administrative and logistics support. So he said to me, Captain Mulholland, I have a very important job for you. I need you to make sure that all of our equipment gets into theatre as quickly as possible. So you are the officer in charge of rear echelon support. And I'm like, that sounds very fancy and very great and I'm I'm honoured to have this position. And it wasn't until a couple of hours later I worked out that he was just trying to keep me in Australia for as long as possible, A, to keep me out of danger, but B, to make sure that I didn't endanger him and the rest of the support unit, media support unit, because I, I just didn't know what I was doing. Well, that's what he thought. But he made a mistake, a very grave tactical error, because the company sergeant major... Um, was formerly Special Forces and there hadn't been an operation the size and scale of East Timor for at least 20 years, if not longer, and none of them had ever gone anywhere. So they were all keen to get onto operations. So he said, ma'am, this is going to be the quickest rear echelon support operation of all time. I want to get into theatre and I'm sure you do too. And I said, what do we need to do? And he said, you just need to make sure we've got seats on an aircraft on the date and time when I tell you. I said, when will that be? He said, I can't tell you. I said, okay. So I just got myself ready and did as much as I could. And when he gave me the go signal, um, I went and got us seats on on an aircraft and he had managed to get our caravan of love and our vehicles, etc., onto a naval ship and it was taking those by sea, and then we were going to fly in. So we got onto one of the 
the C-130s that were taxiing basically between Darwin and Dili. And funnily enough, we ended up on an Alaskan US Air Force plane and the poor um, crew were boiling because they usually are in it. Alaska, which is freezing, and here they were in Darwin, which is like being smothered with a wet blanket. <laughs> so it was just, it was really memorable getting on that plane. But what really sticks in my mind is um, they didn't expect me so quickly and there weren't enough weapons to go around. So they said, don't worry, we'll sort you out once you get into theatre. But the safety briefing as we got on the plane was that the airport was not quite fully contained and that there was still some militia operating near the airport and there could be incoming fire when we landed. So everyone to be at action when I got when they got off the plane. At action means that you've got a round in the chamber and you're ready to fire um, should there be incoming enemy fire. Well, I didn't even have a weapon. I had my mobile phone. That's not really very good in a firefight. So I got on the plane. Everyone else had a rifle. I had nothing except my, you know, sense of humour. And um, so we flew in into Dili and we got off and, and thankfully the airport had been secured by the time we got there. The thing that sticks with me most was when we flew in, Dili was still smoking and that was because the Indonesian-backed militia had burnt everything of value. Um, the Indonesians were in the process of taking the roof tin off everyone's houses and putting it on barges to ship back to Indonesia because it had value. Um, so they they stripped everything of value they could and what they couldn't take, they burnt. Um, so Dili was smoking. There were still small fires everywhere. There were militia still operating in the area. It was a war zone. We got in the back of a army vehicle and were driven out to the Hotel Turismo, which is where the first media support unit was staging out of. It's not a hotel, it's a motel, but like all motels that aspire to more, it's actually called a hotel. Um, and it had been burnt and and as we found out later, people had been killed in the motel. Um, so it basically was a burnt out shell, but the roof had not been taken. It was a um, terracotta roof. Um, so that was still there. So we holed up in there and when I got there, there was barbed wire all around the place. There were guards, army people guarding the front gate and we got let in and the gate shut behind us. And it was at that point that I realised that this was a real war. And even though the real war only lasted for two to three weeks, um, it was quite shocking because I'd never been exposed to anything like it before. And um, Australia has, you know, we, we had some, some bombs dropped in, in World War II in, in far out places like the Torres Strait Islands and Darwin, but um, this, this place had really, really been um, through some, some traumatic events and driving through the streets, the East Timorese were, were wandering around looking like ghosts um, because of what they'd just been through. So a lot of their um, countrymen had been killed, um, a lot of um, their crops had been destroyed, a lot of their animals had been destroyed So, and their wells had been poisoned by the Indonesians as they left. So it was really um, couldn't have been further removed from Australia um, and, and that was shocking, I think. But at the same time, um, we knew that we were really needed and that we could really help. Um, so it was, it was very mixed emotions coming into the country. Mixed emotions, so that real sense of shock as you describe, but also a sense of purpose and that you're there to do a job and an important job. But how did you manage those emotions each day? Because being in that environment, as you say, you walked into a war, you were in the middle of chaos, uncertainty. How did you manage that? Yeah, that's a, a good question. And I, I kind of look back now and, and marvel at who I was then, um, I remember um, we had an OPSO, which is an operations officer, and he was an infantryman and he'd been brought in to help make the unit more robust because you couldn't have a whole bunch of public affairs officers running a unit. Um, so he was very, very straight and very regimented and he turned around to me one day when we were going through some pretty scary stuff and he said, are you scared, Captain Mulholland? And I just looked at him and laughed and I said, if I was scared, I shouldn't be here. Um, what I think he was trying to say is, do you understand the situation that you're in right now and what do you make of it? But because he'd said it to me in that kind of condescending, patronising way, I just kind of gave it back to him. 
<laughs> and I wasn't scared because I was with amazing people. We had a whole bunch of special forces soldiers with us, keeping us safe. Um, the other thing I didn't mention before was we had a contingent of 40 media with us, 20 Australian, 20 international, and I was put in charge of them. Um, because my boss didn't want me outside the wire for the first few days for aforementioned reasons. So I became the mother hen to these journalists who included Chris Reason, Richard Carlton, a whole bunch of ABC journalists and like the creme de la creme of Australian journalists in 1999. And they were hilarious. They were lots of fun to be with. And they thought I was just a novelty. Here I was, this fairly young captain. It was really hot over there. So after hours, we were just getting around in our singlets and cam pants, but still with our rifles slung. So I can only imagine what I looked like to a whole bunch of journalists. And it was great camaraderie with the media. They understood why we were there. They were so keen to cover this story. It had been a bigger story, huge at the time. The international media were um, intense in a way the Australians weren't. I remember our first press conference where General Cosgrove came out to the tur Hotel Turismo to talk to them all and they were literally throwing each other out of the way trying to get their microphones in front of General Cosgrove and where they're going, what are you doing? Like there's, there's enough space for everyone but they were used to a much more combative style of, of media than we had in Australia and we thought the Australians were pretty intense. So it was just such an eye-opener. I had never seen so many journalists in one place and so to watch how it all worked and all happened was really, really interesting. I guess because I had this job to do, and I knew how to deal with journalists because I had been a corporate public relations person before. I just made it my business to make sure that they were well cared for, well catered for, that they get the access that they needed, but also that we kept them safe and secure. Um, and so I had a, a job to do and I knew what that job was and I knew I could do it well. So I just poured my efforts into that. Um, I do remember we were allowed five minutes phone call home per week because we didn't have the internet readily accessible back then. We did get a few workstations in the kiosk a little bit later, but at that point in time, five minutes home each week. And I was single at the time, so my phone call was home to my parents. And I realised I couldn't actually tell them much of what was going on because they were just so worried about their only daughter being in this shooting war, which as it turned out, you know, the the danger, danger part of it was only about three or four weeks and after that it was back to, you know, peacekeeping. Um, but, yeah, it was, you know, you kind of knew that you you were doing something special in a very special circumstance but that people back home wouldn't really understand what it was that you were doing. You mentioned there about the media scrum, about the competition, that, that sense of, of tension about getting the story from that media's perspective. But thinking back now, to what extent were words and language part of the battle? It was interesting because we had 22 countries involved in this. I think it gave it so much credibility that there wasn't much opportunity for negative publicity to find its way in. So the only times that we really had any trouble was when we first got there, all of our soldiers wore their sunglasses, sleek looking mirrored sunglasses, and they all thought they looked pretty cool. East Timorese don't wear sunglasses. And so they thought we were hiding our eyes from them. And they thought that we were really mean and tough and scary. And I don't know who it was in amongst the East Timorese, but someone said something. And thank goodness they did because we didn't realise what effect we were having on them. And so there was a bit of um, tension in the community there, which the media could have very quickly picked up on. But the word got back to the powers that be and the, word, the order went out, take your sunglasses off. <laughs> and so we did. And um, we made sure to engage happily and cheerfully with the local population. And there were kids everywhere. They would run along the side of the road um, trying to get lollies or pens or anything out of us. And we had pockets full of lollies. So we'd be chucking them lollies, which I'm sure their parents thanked us for later. Some of the larrikins amongst us would be yelling out things like, cheers, big ears. 
And so the kids pick this lingo up really quickly. So the next thing, they're running around chasing us going, cheers, big ears. And we knew at that point that we'd won over the local population, so that was fine. The sentiment back in Australia was strong, super strong, um, and we had lots of ministerial visits and the Prime Minister, back then it was John Howard, he was, by all accounts, very happy with how things were going and, and General Cosgrove was masterful in his leadership. He really brought that coalition together. There were some countries in that coalition that didn't think much of each other. He gave them very different jobs and made sure their troops wouldn't be based near each other. And he gave everyone a job that played to their strengths. I've never seen anything like it. But at the same time, he was very personable, very humble, and he engendered trust from the East Timorese leadership right down to the youngest child. And he knew all of our names in the media support unit. He knew, he, he's just one of those people, one of those leaders who has that uncanny ability to see you, to remember you and to remember your husband's name or your children's name or your mother's name or that they were in hospital. How are they today? And I ran into him years later and he said, Captain Mulholland. And I said, oh, my God, sir, how do you remember that? And he said, I don't know. I just remember these things. And I just couldn't believe it. Anyway, he just had that talent and that skill. And he knew he had to be the public face and he knew the media support unit was going to give that to him. It was all done um, with good heart and done very authentically. So I think that worked really well. But what happened was um, the operation was going really well. We were getting great imagery out. Then all of a sudden there was an earthquake in Taiwan and it killed a lot of people. And suddenly media interests switched from East Timor to Taiwan and almost overnight three quarters of the journalists left. It was amazing. So we went from being, you know, pressed every day to get as many stories out as we could and to give them media opportunities and all of that to, hello, is there anyone listening? What was your response to that, to actually watching that happen, knowing how important the operation was, being there on the ground, and then suddenly seeing the world's media lose interest. That was a really salutary moment for me. Um, up until then, I'd been quite naive, I think, and just thought, um, you know, these people really need our help. Isn't it wonderful that everyone's come together? And we had non-government organisations in the mix and we were all working so well together. And all of a sudden the news shift happened and East Timor was dropped by the news media like a hot potato. And so we then had to pick up the slack and, and find ways to get our message out that weren't through the media. But um, I realised then that, you know, it's all about the story um, for the media and for good reason, people want the news. And East Timor wasn't the news anymore. We'd stabilise what we need to stabilise. Um, a lot more work had to be done, but, you know, the the really the heady rush had passed and there was a new heady rush to be chased after. Now, your next deployment was to Bougainville. Talk us through that. How did that come about? So this is where I honed my negotiation skills. I really wanted to go on an expedition to Mount Everest that was planned for 2001 and my boss didn't want me to go. He said, oh, we can't do it without you. And I said, well, it's only only for three months. I'm sure you can release me for that. And he was like, no, I really don't think so. And I said, um, don't they need someone to do the Christmas shift in Bougainville? And he said, yes, why? And I said, what about if I go and do the Christmas shift in Bougainville? Will you then let me go and do the expedition to Mount Everest? And he kind of ummed and out and he said, oh, you drive a hard bargain, but okay. So... I fetched up in Bougainville um, at the end of 2000 and had Christmas and New Year there and then left in about February 2001. And the operation could not have been more different from East Timor if it had tried. Um, I was the only public relations officer. Um, there was a contingent of about 200 um, Australians and New Zealanders left in Bougainville, but the peace monitoring group um, had been going for a very long time and before that there was the truce monitoring group and um, <laughs> it was a very different operation by that stage um, so much so that none of us were armed 
instead of army uniforms, we were all getting around in stubby shorts and bright yellow T-shirts with no chem stuff and peace written on them. You can't stop peace. Um, and these broad brimmed hats that just made us look like we were handymen. <laughs> Bananas in pyjamas, handymen. Um, and we actually had very little to do with um, the Bougainville community because by then they were pretty much working themselves out. They had voted for autonomy and the Papua New Guinea government had accepted the vote um, but had cleverly not set down a date. Um, so it was very peaceable by the time I arrived in Bougainville and the commander has said to me, no PR. And I said, I'm a PR officer. You know, I, that's what I'm here for. And he said, no, nope, we're just here to do our job. We're going to do it quietly. No PR. And I said, well, what am I going to do for the next three months? And he said, I understand you've done the equity advisors course. And I said, yes, why? And he said, well, you're now my equity officer. Congratulations. So I spent the next three months doing hometowner stories trying to get a little bit of imagery back to Australia and flying around with the commanding officer and lecturing people on not flushing foreign objects down the portaloos and to be kind to each other. Um, and that was basically my tour in Bougainville. Was it enjoyable? It actually was um, because uh, we did get to spend a little bit of time with the Bougainville community and they're very um, Christian, very Catholic, and they have open-sided churches and every Sunday they, they would go to church and they would sing and sing and sing and they love to sing and they are musical and they are beautiful. And so they would invite us to, to join in and sing with them and I love to sing. Um, so I was in there singing all these hymns from my Catholic youth and um, it was just beautiful to be part of. They would give us their babies to hold and their babies are beautiful and their skin is almost translucent to the point where it's got a kind of purple sheen and they've got these beautiful big eyes and they're just all happy. So we would be walking around, men and women, wearing these ridiculous banana yellow shirts, cradling these beautiful babies while their mums were singing and it was just the most amazing feeling because, you know, Bougainville is not that far from the northern tip of Australia and and yet here we were in a tropical jungle paradise with people singing to us. It was just magical. Now we'll come back to talking about your singing career a bit later. But before we, we do, you mentioned Mount Everest. So you wanted to support um, an ADF expedition there. And that did happen the following year. Yes, yes, it did, which was amazing. I like to call it a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I loved it. It was amazing, but I do not need to do it again. So um, it was a tri-service adventurous training activity um, led by the Army Alpine Association but with naval and Air Force participants. And the objective was to climb Mount Everest. Um, they had attempted to climb Everest in 1988 I think um, they did get someone to the top. They were on the south side, so in Nepal. This attempt was to be from the Tibetan side um, and they decided they needed a public affairs officer um, to help manage any issues but also to um, provide good news stories back about the expedition and um, defence wouldn't pay for the whole expedition so funds had to be raised and, and all the participants, um, I think, we all put in $9,000 individually um, and then we got sponsors. So we had BOC Gases, for example, and they supplied, supplied us with oxygen. Um, so all of the sponsorships were related to what we were doing, but we needed to then provide a return on the sponsor's investment. So there I was with the camera and I had a laptop and I had a satellite connection and a solar panel to run my um, computer with and I had a dome tent on the side of Mount Everest in Tibet while the climbers attempted to climb to the summit. So it was a really fascinating trip. We flew into Nepal because you can't fly straight into Tibet. We needed to acclimatise to the altitude. So Nepal is at about 3,000 metres. Um, base camp 
in Tibet was going to be around 5,000 metres and then advanced base camp where we would stage out of is at 6,200 metres, somewhere around that. I'm a bit fuzzy on the details, um, but high. And you can't just go straight to that kind of altitude because the human body is not designed to survive at that altitude, um, so you need to work up to it. So we um, did an acclimatisation trek in the Annapurna Sanctuary, which is in Nepal. Most beautiful mountains, 8,000 metre mountains. It's a it's a um, amphitheatre and you basically trek in, do a circuit around the amphitheatre and trek back out. Um, family trekking area. Tourists flock to it each year because it's dramatically beautiful um, and it was gorgeous and you stay at what they call tea houses, which are these little kind of shacks along the way and you have your dinner and lots of lots of tea. Um, and it was just beautiful. But um, unfortunately for us, um, the ice cliff on the side of a mountain decided to fall and um, it came down like a, a freight train um, down the side of a mountain, no noise. Um, and unfortunately, one of our expedition members, his partner and her eight-year-old daughter um, were underneath the ice cliff and it just came down and, and landed on them as well as um, two Israeli trekkers who were there. And we didn't know about it because we were still up in the top of the sanctuary. They decided to leave early because um, KC, the eight-year-old, um, was smaller than the rest of us and might have needed longer to make the trek back to where the bus was going to pick us up. And um, we all, all set off and then um, someone came running back up the path, I think one of our Sherpas, saying there's been a, a massive avalanche down the, down the track um, and people were worried that um, Peter and Michelle and KC might have been there, but we were all like, no, no, they left hours ago. They they should be safely on the other side. But as it had turned out, um, they'd woken up that morning and they'd left KC's boots outside and they'd frozen solid overnight. So they were delayed by a couple of hours de-icing her boots and by the time they got underway, they walked um, straight into the path of this this ice avalanche. So it wasn't snow, it was ice and it was like um, multi-ton blocks of ice coming down the side of this almost vertical um, mountain. So they would have heard a whoosh and that's it. Um, and it took a long time for their bodies to be recovered. The um, Nepalese army had to come in with um, sluicing gear to wash the ice away and, and we'd, we'd gotten back to Kathmandu by that stage. And they found um, Michelle and KC, but they didn't find Peter. And they found his backpack and um, his bones were found months later when the melt happened and the Nepalese had set up a, a net downstream of the river at the bottom of this valley and um, he, his bones um, fetched up there so they were able to have a, a proper funeral for him back in Adelaide he was from. So, yeah, so that was the acclimatisation trek and it was devastating um, in a way that, that is, is hard to hard to think about um, and we didn't know what to do. So we got back to Kathmandu and the ambassador was there and there was a DFAT representative there and we were providing reports back to Australia. The media had started to fly in because they'd heard about it by this stage. The Israelis were there as well and we had to have a meeting to decide what to do, whether we should continue on or whether we should just, just call it off then. Um, and we all got to vote individually and all of us voted to continue on um, because we figured that's what they would have wanted and we'd do it in their memory as well. So we did continue on um, into Tibet um, from Kathmandu and Nepal and it was the most hair-raising journey of my life. Let's just say the uh, roads that hug the sides of mountains in Tibet are not well developed. <laughs> and have you ever seen those those um, YouTube videos of buses that, you know, the middle of them's out over nothing was they're going around corners. That was us. So that, I think that's the most dangerous thing I've ever done in the military. Like I thought flying into East Timor was one thing. These buses were very confronting. But, of course, we made it safely to base camp and 
Tibet is a wondrous place. It's um it's tundra, which means it's above the tree line, so there are no trees. Um, it's it's basically an ice desert, and it is stunningly, startlingly beautiful. And the Tibetan people are just gorgeous. They are just gorgeous. They're all rosy cheeked, and that's because they're at altitude and there's a lot of wind. But they are generous and they are kind and they are welcoming. And it was just, and they dress very colourfully, and their houses and their yaks are all adorned, adorned with colourful cottons because there's no colour in the landscape. And there's prayer flags wherever you can find them and they're all full of colour and, and the idea behind them is every time they flutter in the breeze a prayer, prayer is released. So it's just this kind of mystical, magical, wonderful place and we just drove in a bit further, a bit further, a bit further and then finally you come around the corner and there is Mount Everest and it is black. It's like a black pyramid whereas all the other mountains are covered in snow and the reason the side that we could see was black is because there's so much wind, it actually shears all the ice and snow off the side of the mountain. So it's very stark. It's very confronting and it is so big. I mean, it sounds ridiculous to say this, but you can't visualise what an 8,000 metre or nearly 9,000 metre mountain looks like. And you figure you're already at 5,000 metres, so it's only another three kilometres of vertical height. <laughs> but to get three kilometres up, you actually need a lot of width um, on the mountain. So it actually takes days to walk up it, if you make it at all from the advanced base camp. It's just so big. I just could not believe how big it was. So, yeah, I found myself in in Tibet. We'd been through this, this tragic um accident under the avalanche but agreed to go on and and so we we set up our base camp and then we went up to advanced base camp which was a 22 kilometer walk up through this glacial moraine which is um all the rocks that have been thrown up over the years by the moving glacier so there's ice underneath but then there's rocks on top and there's this kind of little goat track that goes up there that's been made by sherpas and yaks taking supplies up for climbers and it's up down up down up down up down and it honestly was almost beyond me the only way i got up to advanced base camp was i put my pack on a yak eventually and i only had to carry a day pack um, but boy was i happy to get into advanced base camp because it was physically and mentally very very tough and we walked through blizzards and all kinds of things on the way there so it was just it was like being in outer space honestly what an experience <laughs> and then a few months later things change for you significantly with your career we'll come to that in a moment but we shouldn't forget that you also worked on op gold as part of the Sydney 2000 Olympics. Um, and that was also a defining moment in your army career at that time. So tell us a bit about that particular deployment. Operation Gold, it was a security operation. So we were providing security for the Olympics all around the country, but we were based out of Sydney. It was probably the happiest time in my military career because I got to work with um, Captain and later Lieutenant Colonel Mike Harris, who unfortunately um, died five years ago after several rounds with cancer. He mentored me when I first started. And in fact, he was the public relations officer in Vanamo in Papua New Guinea on that footage that I saw when I was back working as a public servant that inspired me to join up in the first place. So I got to spend a year working with him and we were just a terrific team. And we had a whole bunch of other people with us as well. But we wrote the plan that would determine how um, the Commonwealth would work with the state governments um, in terms of public relations, um, and we got to execute that plan. We also worked very closely with the Special Forces Counterterrorism Task Force, um, so we got to to see how they do um, domestic counterterrorism operations, and that was fascinating. They're like this well-oiled machine who knew exactly what their job was, and they did it really well. It was just a time in Australia where we were still, before the global situation started to deteriorate again, I think, and so just the world was happy, Australia was happy, Sydney was happy, and we were happy. Now, you took a break from full-time military service for a few years to have a family, and then you rejoined as an army reservist in 2011. I'm interested to know, given that your career has spanned 24 years and you're still a public affairs officer today as an army reservist, what's changed, do you think, 
over the years in terms of what you've seen with regard to perhaps the use of technology, the fact that, as you described years ago, even having a mobile phone was a novelty. And of course, now everything's done by phone, internet. We didn't even have internet back in the the mid-90s. So what's that meant for you? Citizen journalism has changed the face of things. So we've got the internet. Everyone's got access to the internet. You know, even the poorest communities, well, in fact, some of the poorest communities around the world have got the best internet because they totally skipped over having landlines and went straight to the internet. And because of their crazy terrains, et cetera, they have 5G. Um, So everyone who needs to pretty much can access the internet these days, either through public libraries or through their own handset. Well, getting a mobile phone back in the day you had to be someone special or have to have a like a really particular reason to have one and they were guarded jealously. Well, everyone's got one in their pocket these days, you know. Every teenager's got one in their pockets and so the world is connected in a way that it never was before. These days, everyone has access to everything and that brings its own challenges, you know, how do you cut through the noise? And I think for public affairs professionals around the world, It's how do you actually engage with the people that you need to engage with in a way that's meaningful Um, and you don't don't have command of the channels like you used to. So it's a very different experience these days. But what hasn't changed is that our job as public affairs officers is to explain military activity to the civilian population so that they can have trust that what we're doing is right and that it aligns with what the government's been asking us to do and that the government is aligned with what the community wants. So it's it's really squaring the circle. We do still do that with the greatest of care. Now, what we haven't talked about, Lily, is something that you touched on earlier on in your interview, and, and I'd like to talk about this before we, before we leave you today. You talked about that beautiful singing that you heard in Bougainville, and I know that you're a singer, you're also an actress and a model. So tell us a bit about those creative pursuits and and how they fit in with being an army officer. For years I was told, you don't look like an army officer. And I'd say, what is an army officer supposed to look like? And I think they were supposed to look very serious. And I've always taken a lot of joy in everything that I do. I sing more enthusiastically than, than technically, but I really enjoy singing the blues because It's about telling stories and engaging people. I write novels and they are about telling stories, engaging people. And even with the the modelling I do, it's not fashion modelling, it's it's, uh, commercial modelling. So being in advertisements and things like that, I've done a little bit of theatre work as well. I've been an extra on TV and um, I just love being on set because what you're doing there is watching a whole bunch of people collaborating to tell a story. So this is the theme of my life. I love telling stories and, and it's no different whether I'm in uniform or out of uniform outside of work. Major Lily Mulholland, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us today. I've known you for some time and I have to say some of the stories you've shared, particularly about your time in Timor, Bougainville, Mount Everest and even at the Sydney Olympics, inspiring. Thanks very much for joining us on Life on the Line. Thanks, Sharon. I really enjoyed it too. I'm Sharon Maskeldare and you've been listening to Life on the Line. Follow this show at Life on the Line podcast on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube at L-O-T-L pod on Twitter, and at Thistle Productions on LinkedIn. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions, artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Workhoven. Thank you for listening, and lest we forget. <laughs>